scripture the gospel said to love as Jesus has loved you. But what does that love look like? Now, I'm preparing to marry a new couple here at Delmont. And over at Severin, there's some young adults, and they're so in love. And so I would say that love looks like the blush on a young person's cheek when they say the name of the one they love. And it, to me, it looks like little shared secrets and little giggles and stolen kisses and holding hands. But for those of us that have been in relationships a long period of time, like the Strivas, like Frank and I, like Gus and Jim, for, for us, we know that love continues to grow. And so that thrill of the first romance is just a beginning. If you go to a wedding, or a baptism, or even here in worship, and you look at a couple who's been married for a while, you see them share glances, that shared look. Those shared looks speak volumes about stability and endurance and deep, deep support that only comes when you manage to survive <coughs> trials together. When I go to visit people in hospital, I see love as one person lifts the cup of water to the sick person's lips. And as they take away bloody tissues and half-eaten food, and as they rearrange the IV so they can still hold hands. Love is revealed through sacrifice. Thomas Merton, a Trampist monk and writer, said, to love, you have to crawl out of the cradle where everything is about getting. And you have to grow up to the <coughs> maturity of giving without any concern for what you're going to get in return. <coughs> Real love, deep love exposes our value. It, it shows us who we are. Virgin <coughs> says, my true meaning and worth are shown not in the estimate of myself, but in the eyes of the one who loves me. That one must love me as I am, with my faults and my limitations, revealing to me the truth, that these faults and limitations cannot destroy my worth in their eyes that I am therefore valuable as a person in spite of my shortcomings. The ultimate example of this is Jesus. Jesus is love incarnate. Jesus is love in action. It's like God had been trying to show the people, trying to show us what love was like. And we just kind of, sort of, got it sometimes. And so, he sent us Jesus to demonstrate what love is. And Jesus went and broke down every barrier that humans put up. For example, in Jesus' time, if you had leprosy, you not only had to live apart from the other people, but when you did go out into the villages, you had to say, unclean, unclean, so that everybody would make sure that they would move away from you and no one would touch you by accident. <coughs> and yet when we read in Mark, in the first chapter of Mark, when Jesus met one of those people, he was so moved by <coughs> compassion that he reached <coughs> out and touched the man and cured him of his leprosy. In another story, it tells of Jesus calling a tax collector to be his disciples in Mark 2, 14. Tax collectors made their living by over-collecting. They made their living by extortion. Okay, this is not a good thing. 
And yet, Jesus called Levi to follow him. His, you know what else he showed us? His love for all. His love for immigra immigrants, for people from other nations. His love for people of other faiths could reach across the boundaries that we naturally <coughs> send. And we see this when he cures the daughter of the non-Jewish Seraphonician woman. On the last day, so he, he knew it was his last day, but his fellows did not. And he gathered everybody together, and he blessed the bread and shared the wine, and he created that ritual that we celebrate each month. <clears throat> and he did something else that night, too. He humbly washed the feet that was the lowest job that you could have if you were hostessing, would be to have a servant wash the feet of your guests. And then he said, love each other as I have loved you. He could have come and conquered through the military, but he didn't. He humbly, generously gave up his life so that we might be saved. God's love is bigger, more extravagant, bigger than our whole imaginations could contain. It can't be manipulated. It can't be bargained with. It can't be earned. It can't be lost. It fills the whole of creation for light. It shines with joy from the heavens. Every single breath we take is because of God's love. And yet, we still only kind of, sort of, get it. Even great men struggle with this. So, we hear of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. <coughs> Growing up in a Christian home, going to university to study to be a priest of the Church of England, and yet he still doesn't really get how he could be loved by God. Until one day on May 24th in 1738, at a meeting at Altersgate in London, while he was listening to the words of Martin Luther King in a preface that was written before the section on Romans, and his heart was strangely warmed, and he realized, he understood, he came to believe that even he was loved fully and completely by God. He said of that moment, I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation and assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sin, even mine, and saved even me from the law of sin and death. We have the scriptures that command and describe what love is. And we have Jesus who modeled what love, how love works. And we have these great men like Martin Luther and like Wesley. And we have their words, and yet we still only kind of sort of get it. I think it really clicks for each person when they meet another human being that shines with God's love. It's like God's love is contagious from person to person. Now just think for a moment and remember who formed you in your faith. <coughs> who looked at you and accepted you for who you were with all your limitations? Who encouraged you to love like God loves? <clears throat> I've been going around and asking all of the small groups this week that same question. <clears throat> Several people have told, told me about parents or grandparents who simply demonstrated Christian love by living the Christian life. And one woman told me of two leaders of her little church who came to her house and visited her and 
guided her until she could understand that she was worthy of God's love. And others spoke of really deep person-to-person -person friendships in which one friend took so many opportunities to share that she was an inspiration, a motivation, a light. And to quote this friend directly, she was a daily reminder of how one should live life. The other friend was the cautionary, the one who adds that layer of discernment, making all those service opportunities safer <coughs> and healthier for both of them. Together they were like the bookends on a holding the whole story of God's love between them. Others mention names with such reverence that it evoked strong memories. These are people who love more generously. They somehow are able to lift the rest of us out of our envy, out of our resentments, out of our depressions, out of hyperactivity and boredom and away from fear so that we live and love more perfectly. They help us become more generous of our love. Kirsten, and she told me of Luann Colson. Well, I didn't get to know Luann. She was gone before I got here. But these are the kind of people that are mentioned. Someone else mentioned um, Ginger and Tony Basiglio. Uh, you got to understand when they share this story, it's just not like, yeah, Ginger was a good woman. <coughs> oh, they, they, they can't even find the words to express how this woman so completely shared her love. I also asked Sherry and Stephanie Ross here today in the hopes that they would share their story. I was 18 years old when I got pregnant with my son. It was, uh, needless to say, uh, nowhere near the best circumstances. And to get out of that, I actually ran six blocks uh, the week after Thanksgiving in basketball shorts and a tank top, pregnant, and called my mom 1-800-COLLECT. It was bad. Um, I took refuge in my mom's house, I hoarded myself in my room, and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do with this baby, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm done. I threw my hands up. Um, she talked me into going to church one Sunday, and I went to church. Pregnant, morning sickness, all was the worst. And um, we went to stand for, I guess it was the sermon or something, and I was so sick, I did not want to stand up. Well, I had a lady behind me tap me on my shoulder and say, you need to stand up. And I turned around and I said, um, I'm pregnant. I don't feel good. I don't want to be here anyway. I don't want to stand up. And when I left church that day, I said, I'm never stepping foot into a church again. And it took me weeks. And my mom then said, you know what, there's this church I want you to go to, it's different, I don't want to go, don't want to go. Well, needless to say, she convinced me. <laughs> and uh, I walked in here and nobody looked at me differently, nobody. Uh, they didn't care that I was 18 and pregnant, they didn't care that I was not married, they didn't care that you know I got my GED while I was pregnant with my son. They didn't care about anything that I'd gone through. They understood that, you know, people make mistakes, but that doesn't make the person. Um, it made a difference. They didn't realize it, y'all didn't realize it, but I tell people when they ask me where my home church is, this is my home church. And I tell them why, I was not judged here. My son was not judged here. Not for one second did they look at my son and say, oh, well, your mother had you out of wedlock. And I tell you, that makes a difference when you have your own family members looking at you and saying, you can't be part of my family because you had a child out of wedlock. And that's not what I believe in. When I was pregnant with my son, I was invited to 
Trey's birthday party. <laughs> and I come in, birthday hand or birthday gift in my hand, and I'm like, oh, okay. Do, 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 do. I walk downstairs, everybody's like surprised, and I'm like, where's Trey? <laughs> Needless to say, um, it was not Trey's birthday party. It was a baby shower. A baby shower. I had friends. I had family come together and throw me this shower for this baby that I didn't even know what I was going to do with, that I thought my life was over. But they said, your life isn't over. You know, it's just begun. This is your child. You know, this is it's your time to make your mark on the world. I didn't decide until I was seven months pregnant that I was keeping my child. People did not know that I was thinking about adoption. They just didn't know. And I came here and I felt accepted and I felt like it was going to be okay. And I kept my son. That little boy who came up here and counted to ten, that's mine. <laughs> that's my little boy. <laughs> so I just wanted to let y'all know that it, it was big acceptance. I um, got pregnant again. Um, I have a two and a half year old that is adopted. And, um, you know, I could have kept him. I could have been raising two right now. But I looked at it and I said, you know what? I'm a single mother. I'm raising my son. I'm doing my darndest. At that point in time, I was also in a custody battle trying to get him back. Y'all still didn't judge me. But I realized that my youngest deserved a family. He deserved an upbringing that I was already struggling to give one. My second son was born 10 weeks early. He almost did not make it. He was uh, diagnosed with neck. It's bacteria in your intestines. It's like flesh-eating bacteria. He was <coughs> 2 pounds, 2.3 ounces when he was born. He almost died. I almost died. Um, he's two and a half years old today. He has the greatest family ever, and he goes to church, he goes to Sunday school, he has a mommy and a daddy, and while his life is perfect in that regards, I'm able to provide my son with a different type of perfectness, a perfectness that I didn't even know was possible until I came here and realized my life wasn't over, and I was still accepted. So, just wanted to share. Thank you. When we look around this room, we see names on every window. We see names on the altar rail. We see names on the pulpit and on the lectern and on <coughs> this table. We see names on the baptismal font. These are all physical reminders of the love and generous gifts of others. Now, several of us have been reading through Robert Schnazy's devotional guide, and in the Friday reading over the second week, the author describes the practicing ex extravagant generosity is a fundamental activity because we ourselves have been recipients of extravagant generosity. He says every sanctuary that we have worshipped in, every church piano that has lifted our spirits, every pew that we have sat in, every communion rail where we have knelt, every classroom where we have gathered as friends, every hymnal <coughs> that we have sang from, every kitchen that has prepared our meals, all of these are the fruits of others' generosity. We've been recipients of grace upon grace. We are the heirs and benefactors of all who came before us and were touched by the generosity of Christ enough to give generously so that we could experience the truth of Christ ourselves. We owe that same to the generations that follow us. 
We have worshipped in a sanctuary that we did not build. So it falls to us the privilege of building sanctuaries where we will never worship. When I read the, these words, I think not only of <coughs> sanctuary, the place within the church, I think about sanctuaries of the heart, a place where there is forgiveness and acceptance and inspiration and potential for growth. That's what we owe. We owe it to our little ones to have a nursery so that, uh, or, or some kind of service so that their parents can be recentered in the spirit. We owe it to teach our children the stories of Jesus. We owe it to our youth to help them through their own foreigner moment. And I don't mean <coughs> foreigner as in not of this nation. I mean like the rock group. You know, I only want to know what love is. And I want you to show me, right? Humor aside, we owe it to our community, the community beyond our walls of this church, to share the love of Christ and create sanctuaries of the heart everywhere. I interviewed a gentleman this week who represented all the churches that are involved in the Christian Assistance Program, what we commonly refer to as CAP. And he's looking for a new home for the soup kitchen. And as he talked and shared stories, I realized that what drives people into a soup kitchen is not hunger alone. It's loneliness. Loneliness, the lack of love. We can do this. We can teach our children. We can serve our community. We can engage in more missions like Cycle for Survival. We can offer bold and vital ministries that change the world and relieve suffering and deepen justice and encourage love. We can be lovers of the community, like Jesus loved us. Amen. <laughs>